So I was saying a special thank you to our keynote speaker, Professor Wilfried Bolewski, who since the first moment kindly accepted our invitation. At the time, almost one year ago, or more than one year ago, it was meant to be face to face in Lisbon. And uh, well, as you can see, it was not. Uh, so many things changed since that first invitation. Well, this is the poor Mark people talk. The first was in Ghent, uh, then in Valencia, and last February in Bucharest. As I suppose most of you know, this is a project from the Mark Network, a network with five universities. Université de Lorraine, France, Artwell University College, Belgium, University of Bucharest, Romania, Universidad Peuca, Nigeria, Spain, and of course, Ischgl, University of Lisbon. In fact, four years ago in Larn, Belgium, at our dear Anne-Marie Couton home, we started planning this project. We came from three editions of an intensive program on government relations and lobbying from a, a European perspective. And we started to move on. Well, I cannot tell you exactly every step of the path we did in those days. But as usual with this team, after great exchange of ideas, laugh, agreements, and of course, disagreements, tea and coffee, a lot, food, a lot of critical thinking, but above all, with willingness to bring something rich and useful to students, academics, and to the business world, we came up with three concepts, public, diplomacy, corporate diplomacy, and civic diplomacy. It's true that we already have some literature on this concept, but not with a European perspective. This is the main goal of this project, to contribute to build a European body of knowledge around these three concepts, and by so, develop a European higher education curriculum in public, corporate, and civic diplomacy. This journey began in February 2019 with a talk in Ghent, then another one in Valencia. We, we went through a great intensive study program in the end of the, that year with <clears throat> the irreplaceable contributions of our students and with a deep, really, deep sadness. I cannot talk to you about the ISP 2020. That's why I hate this coronavirus. Well, but we continue with a third talk in February 2020 in Bucharest and now here in Lisbon. Or in fact, wherever we, you are right now. But we will continue with the Mark Diplo International Conference that will take place here in Lisbon in May 31 and 1st of June. And I must tell you, be aware, because the deadline closes in five days. Then we will have the publication of the proceedings and another talk. And with the publication of the book, we will close this project but we are already thinking about a new journey. So, many hours of reflection and readings have brought us here to the Mark People Talk Lisbon, where we will reflect around corporate diplomacy as a compass for public-private management in turbulent times. Taking into account the international context increasingly characterized by volatility, uncertainty, 
complexity and ambiguity of the world, this increasing sharpened the challenge in terms of relations between nations, between nations and people, but also in the relationship between transnational organizations with nations and with people where those organizations are located. With this context, our keynote speaker says that corporations are becoming diplomatic co-actors in the trade of diplomacy and acquiring access to the diplomatic arena. Well, in fact, and to be polemic, I say not just corporations. I'm remembering a video this team made about the term corporations and corporate, as well as many readings and also some of the doubts of our ISP students. When we talk about corporations or when we use the term corporate, are we referring companies, business, private enterprises? If we are, what can we say if the action actor is a foundation or an association or an NGO? I will not discuss now what label can we use in these cases. But I would say that not just corporations are becoming diplomatic co-actors. In fact, we are seeing organizations with different natures, natures from the third sector, associations, NGOs, uh, foundations, and others, playing an important role in diplomatic arena. In many cases alone, but also acting or co-acting with states, with public or international organizations, with corporations, or all these actors in collision. Well, I do, do not have a firm answer to these thoughts, but I would say this is not an ended story, and there is much more to reflect. As you can see, many thoughts, many conversations, many articles, many books, and many authors challenge and inspire us. And without a doubt, one of these authors is Professor Bolensky. You will understand in a few moments why he challenge and inspire us. For now, let me say that he is a professor of international law and diplomacy at Sciences Po in Paris, the American University of Paris, and Free University of Berlin, and a former German diplomat who has served in Italy, Poland, Australia, Pakistan, Cameroon, and was ambassador to Jamaica, Belize, and Bahamas. He participated in the NATO nuclear planning group and the United Nations Conference on Disarmament. Professor Bolemski has served as deputy chief of protocol for German Chancellor Schroeder and Merkel. He is publishing on new dimensions of diplomacy, including the role of multinational corporations and non-state actors. So much better than having me talking about this topic Please welcome and listen to our guest, Professor Bolensky. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and the opportunity to offer you and your colleagues some orientation knowledge for public private management in turbulent times. In her closing lecture at the Collège de France in 2011, the French philosopher jurist Mireille Delmas Marty characterized the leading themes of future governance as resilience, responsibility, and anticipation. Indeed, in unprecedented times, the collective future cannot be perceived any longer as a reliable certain continuance of the past and the present. Since past experience does not always offer the appropriate guidance about what we should be doing. Our knowledge management for time-bounded decision-making in shifting realities does not only rely on the conventional wisdom 
of analytical, arithmetic, linear modeling, what I would call algorithms of oppression, replicating past-oriented, accumulated certainties, patterns, paradigms, theories, and attitudes. It should rather question open and often flawed assumptions by including humans anticipating capacities such as imagination, flexibility, and agility to pierce the veil of ignorance and to fill the vacuum of information about the unknown and unknowable future events. The trademark of leadership in unsettling times of fundamental uncertainty will be the integration of traditional factual experience and orientation knowledge with the intellectual and moral virtues as essentials of practical wisdom and foresight. Such a cognitive process of decision-making and innovative action will be based on future-oriented creativity and psychological intuition. The change of mindset to alternative thinking will lead us to an overarching sense of purpose and perspective of the manager of expectations and assumptions for an imagined future where nothing is certain anymore, the unpredictable and improbable becomes possible, and the impossible reveals itself to be a possible certainty. Various black swans could impose new normalcies against the denial of the ob obvious. In order to perform the function of governing the unknowable, leaders will have to, to imagine a state-of-the-art everyday reality whenever the status quo is untenable. Learning to live with systemic uncertainty. Since this cannot be fully rationalized, emotional intelligence and empathy are needed to avoid a reality shock. In the 21st century, our universal community of fate with a shared destination is characterized by grand challenges and global fragilities, such as economic volatility and societal upheavals. These destabilizing turbulences reveal a paradigmatic fracturing of political and social orders with their dysfunctional multilateral organizations towards an era of fragmented and disintegrated international disorder. Exogenous events and disruptive developments like pandemics, migrant crisis, climate change induced natural disasters, water and food scarcity and cyber attacks require coordinated and collaborative efforts to engage in tackling these epical intersocietal threats and ruptures with boldness inspired by principal pragmatism. These violent and recurrent emergencies in complex systems of changing environments necessitate an alternative culture of extreme risks sharing, including imaginative scenarios, constellations, and the assessment of their probability. Consequently, the nature of international relations is shifting from state management to intersocial and intersocietal, as well as transversal governance. This readjustment within the state rules based international system requires a revolution in thinking and acting, bringing the social into the international. The lack of reliable knowledge about these future events makes it difficult to understand, analyze, mitigate, and respond to social, geopolitical, and economical, as well as environmental challenges. But in our interdependent world, one can assume that this critical capacity of human ingenuity will eventually secure that every global challenge will find its sustainable solution on the basis of cooperative sovereignty and transnational solidarity. Today, 
the responsibilities for navigating and influencing the dynamics of inter internal and external multiplex turbulences are shared in a society at large perspective by all actors in the public and private spheres. This phenomenon is more and more important for international business managers to consider geopolitics as relevant to their activities, to integrate political risk analysis into their business decisions, and aligning market strategy with non-market public concerns. Interacting within shifting geopolitical realities through collaboration with government in a dialectical not vertical process is benefiting both the wider common good of societies and the bottom line of long-term shareholder values. The future role of business and society should be mindful of the increased focus on environmental, social and governance concerns. This management approach could open a leadership path for an emergent people-oriented economy, serving also legitimate societal needs, including the perception of their general relevance, fairness, and social usefulness, instead of selective prestige and privileged comfort. Within the context of economics of mutuality, economics for humans, or economy for life, it acknowledges the the pro-social behavioral imprint of business. In developing profitable and sustainable solutions for shared societal problems, instead of earning profits at the expense of some people and the environment, what is called the economics, economics of more. Economics is about people who are not emotionless, hyperrational, calculating machines, economists sometimes wish they were. Transnational companies aiming at a competitive edge need to include the potential impact of the widening array of global political actors. The growing relationship between business and the external shareholders also emphasizes the urgency for diplomatic skills and sheds new light on the virtues of diplomacy. <coughs> Now, let's turn to the virtues of diplomacy as societal concept. International society is in demand of content sensitive orientation knowledge to assess, adjust, and accommodate diplomacy's essentials, which are human factor interdependency and interactions, the so called diplomacy for good, to new expectations of the public sphere. This requires an opening through reflexive consciousness towards the values and culture of diplomatic engagement and negotiations. Decision makers should learn to think and act responsibly through the middle of conflictual situations towards compromise, thus managing politics into the future through diplomacy. At a tipping point, such a paradigm shift of government mentality, governing mentality, will create a diplomatic watershed moment in the management process of public-private partnering, aiming at compromise and consensus building as major accomplishments. Especially in times of crisis, cooperation is needed to avoid diplomatic divide between state government and the corporate world. Reappraising its moral and civilizing virtues, a socially embodied diplomacy. Not tied solely to the state and its actors, could become a form of third culture, a societal diplomacy with and through human relational practices. This encounter with self and other can even lead to a process of diplomatic social bonding among actors. Such a form of everyday diplomacy applies also to the ways individuals and communities, such as transnational companies, as well as NGOs and other associations, may I say, Susanna, engage with and influence decisions about world affairs. 
This nascent knowledge area, turning into an innovative management practice, has developed over the last decade, dealing with geopolitics and non-commercial risks in international relations by sharing social societal responsibilities among government and business. The concept is known as we all know corporate diplomacy. Now, while both terms, corporate diplomacy and business diplomacy, have been employed, defined, and distinguished, the general accepted usage seems to move slightly towards corporate diplomacy, be it as, as it may. I'm not defending terminology, rather ideas, concepts, and realities. Corporate diplomacy as a governance compass for multiplex turbulences. Today's societal purpose of international management is not merely business. And business is not an end in itself, but its social impact should also serve a common good purpose. Changing community expectations demand that future managers and leadership positions, your audience, will have to project themselves differently, relinquishing certain mainstream beliefs of unlimited economic growth and human perfectibility while responding and reacting to social and environmental challenges as problem solvers. The aim is to provide socially inclusive growth as well as securing the resilience and general acceptance of social credit for corporations. In light of state failures, especially in dysfunctional societies with incapable or unwilling governments, corporations share the important role of generating and diffusing innovations that contribute to sustainable development. Thus, management engagement in social problems of a more inclusive society becomes an alternative logic, a new upper overarching sense of practical purpose and a moral imperative for business leaders. This targeted form of perceived values and identity-driven marketing will shape the future asset of an undivided corporate integrity. More and more corporate leaders are already acknowledging that environmental, social and governance issues are important for their business interests. This extended purpose of environmental social governance is also fostering a long-term strategic perspective in times of fundamental uncertainties. While corporations are likely to respond first to the business case as usual, some are at the same time embracing the ethical values case for changing corporate behavior to profit within the public purpose of economy of for life and restraint for the sake of societal usefulness. With principled action in response to public expectations, corporations can also create and sustain value as well as societal worth. Confronted with social and environmental demands, international business enterprises seen as private public entities are requested to get involved in issues of public concern by providing public goods and co-creating more just and peaceful coexisting societies. International diplomacy provides the tools for corporate conflict management. In tackling grand challenges, corporations are becoming diplomatic co-actors in the trade of diplomacy and, in, and acquiring access to the diplomatic arena. Thus, multilateral corporations are to be acknowledged both as objects and actors in diplomatic processes and international affairs. Operating in an increasingly complex and volatile environment, transnational corporations should merge their business knowledge with the diplomatic knowledge in order to define zones where these two could overlap and cross fertilize. Experience the rising importance of the diplomatic mindset and practices as relational communication management into the future. To navigate the ship of business through these challenges, it is an imperative that global corporations integrate corporate diplomacy as governance compass into the strategic planning 
to successfully match the liabilities that come with operating in a foreign market. When corporate diplomacy activities are aiming at economically as well as socially sustainable business solutions, they can, and at the same time, improve the public perception of companies' legitimacy in society, what is now called the social credit of, of business, by practicing political influence and filling government gaps. This perceived legitimacy and trust capital will also accredit them as political actors and civil society representatives. In order to strengthen their place in society, they should treat societal shortcomings as opportunities, connecting business success with social transformations by harmonizing or at least reconciling economic with social goals. Transnational corporations can profit from traditional state diplomacy in order to create an enabling business environment to anticipate and avoid costly conflicts if they practice corporate diplomacy as a dialectical decision-making process and key concept of trusted and coordinated collaboration on a national as well as international level with government and local host communities. In this context, Kirsten Mogensen recognizes the following diplomatic procedures. Engaging in dialogue with local publics in host communities, building long-term relationships, sharing information, recognizing others' values, mediating different interests and shaping compromises with local civil society representatives. Indeed, in my professional experience, the essence of diplomatic practice consists of managing situational and contextual ambivalence and harmonizing divergent interests and expectations with a holistic approach of emotional, social, and intercultural intelligence. Moreover, corporate diplomacy provides the soft power for non-state diplomatic actors. As I said, multilateral NGOs, even smart cities, associations. To increase their activities and follow their own agenda in the international arena, as well as to engage in providing solutions to global problems such as climate change. As polycentric globalization, which is social by nature and geopolitical and economical in function, forces corporations to take on more diplomatic missions. Governments themselves tend to adopt a more corporate business focused approach in opening up markets to domestic industries using corporate networks and their proactive innovation, intuition, flexibility, and bargaining tactics. To become more economically competitive. The state market nexus and interdependence, which is revitalizing diplomacy through greater coordination by state and non-state actors, is best exemplified by the cooperative approach to the geoeconomic implementation of sanctions policy. This symbiotic relationship between corporate and government actors creates a synergy between the private and public spheres through a privatized diplomacy with a further extension into a triangular pattern of relations between public, private, and civic entities. This privatization could pave the way for reshaping their operational environment in a new social and even moral contract. I'm seeing a new social contract developing. Now let me turn with a few remarks to uh, the most recent example of corporate diplomacy implementation and that's COVID-19 pandemic. In the global coronavirus pandemic, trans transnational companies are taking up the role of public utilities with the supply of medical equipment, substituting for or collaborating with government leadership, thus guiding a transition in individual and societal behaviors 
towards the triple solidarity of government, business, and science. Global catastrophes like pandemics demonstrate the urgency for public-private partnership in solidarity between government and business for a human-centered security. To provide future financial, economic, and social resilience in times of international catastrophes, government can also profit from corporate experience and innovation in anticipatory risk assessments, including banks and insurance. And business will appreciate in the last resort the cover from governmental intervention and security. In an open society, they both can best face ex exceptional tasks with new forms of cooperation. One lesson in my mind of COVID-19 capitalism, moving from crisis to opportunity, while accelerating societal trends, is that big business needs big governments and vice versa, to solve such enormous problems with a sense of shared responsibility. Government exercises its power to guide the economy with regard to public health by including by, by funding for basic research, patent enforcement, safety regulations, distribution, dispensation of vaccines, and act as the absolute, uh, ultimate absorber of society-wide risks so that business can develop its commercial ability to turn research ideas into marketable products. Here are my conclusions. In a post-global era, polycentric governance needs an appropriate compass for the business government nexus. In an increasingly horizontal society and an open government partnership. Over the past decades, the conceptual breakthrough of corporate diplomacy has formed a base for innovation diplomacy and gain considerable traction in academia, as well as in business practice, providing a strategic communication management tool into the future, which is called corporate state, uh, statecraft. This qualitative leap towards a change of government mentality, governing mentality, signifies a corporate commitment to diplomatic efforts for a symbiotic and coordinated cooperation between business government. With regard to major societal challenges in our universal community of faith, a solidary public-private partnership on the basis of public spirit and diplomatic principles, values, and participatory strategies could turn into a form of whole of society governance through privatized diplomacy. Monumental crises, such as the current pandemic, are testing the traditional orthodoxy of liberal capitalism and can create political space to transform the overarching sense of practical purpose and the dominant logic, as well as the nature of the economic, economy's role in society. In a cum COVID world, and I don't think of a past COVID world. There were already other COVIDs around this world. The quest for the status quo ante cannot be the compass. The capitalism will best survive with the inclusion of transnational solidarity, empathy, and a practical duty for societal due diligence and humanist care. Public expectations to recognize and to tackle, to tackle shifting realities demand from purpose-driven management the courage for an innovative mentality and collaborative approach towards resilient solutions for the common good. Corporate diplomacy as a promising business, business tool is designing the course correction for what Kirsten Morgensen again values as a corporate legitimacy diamond, or Ronfeld Aquila 
perceive as a new global realm of the mind. In smart social management to be relevant in a new normal and to sustain performance in the coming decades, radical reimagining and boldness inspired by principle of pragmatism are in demand. Extraordinary paradigm shifts of forward thinking and acting are not only necessary, but possible. Yet actual progress does not happen automatically, we know. It requires creative and determined leadership to nudge it along towards solving our health, social environment, and economic problems. This is the time for multi-actor, networked responsibility to attach purpose-driven conditions to emergency policies and to promote a change of culture towards a multi-stakeholder mindset for global political and social economy. What I call the passage from homo economicus to homo societates for a new global political and social economy, which could mean the end of economy we used to practice. Corporate diplomacy is a, as a topical learning could serve as a landmark for the fundamental shift in corporate purpose, including the mindfulness for societal concerns and common social goods, leading to the ev evolution of corporate governance towards a stakeholder capitalism. This systemic change, these systemic changes of collective purpose will engage a state of mind that will be able to creatively manage evolving realities. The perspective of an era of heightened and enduring risks imposes a sense of shared responsibilities among all parts of society. Eventually, human agency will prevail over business as usual. Thank you very much. I'm waiting for your questions and comments and remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bolinsky. Uh, uh, I suppose now all of us un understand much better when I said that you challenge and uh, uh, inspire us. Um, now I uh, open the floor to our participants. Uh, I, I thank you, all of you, for being here with us. Uh, we are many. <laughs> so, uh, uh, again, I, I, I ask you um, to, to ask questions. Please use the chat. Say your name, uh, your first name, your name, uh, the organization which you come from. Uh, asking your questions, as I told you, um, we can, we can, uh, I can call your name or you can just uh, uh, leave on the shop your, your question. So, who will be the first? <laughs> Anne-Marie? <laughs> Okay, Anne-Marie, Anne-Marie Couton from Art Welt University College, uh, our colleague, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will, for, uh, for your uh, inspiring conference. Um, I think that while well, we all will have a lot of questions uh, based on, on what, you, what you told us, well, um, I already have plenty of them, but well, I will uh, just start with, with one, which is already a double question, actually. I also post it into the chat so that it would be easier for you also to, to read it, uh, uh, because as I said, it's, it's a double question. So I was from the beginning uh, very, very triggered by what you called the shift of mindset. Um, because what you say or what you said in the beginning was that path dependence um, is not um, of reliable help anymore uh, to help leaders in their decision making. But instead, they need, and you, you use the words uh, imagination, 
flexibility and agility uh, to project into uh, what you uh, described as being the unknowable future events and scenarios. So based on, 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 what, on this statement that you gave us in, in the beginning of, uh, of your conference, I, I have two questions. The first is, um, how would you then describe the preparedness of our actual leaders in terms of emotional intelligence and empathy? This is the first one. This is regarding our leaders and the decision makers within the organization. And the second part, the second part of my question is, um, how could the corporate diplomats be of any help? And if they would be of any help, according to you, why and how? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I take it up immediately before other questions are coming in? OK. So we have the freshness of the, the, the question in my, my answer. You're touching upon um, the great world of uh, decision making. I had um, a chance for several years to be close to, not responsible for, I'm gladly to say, because that uh, prevents me from writing memoirs <clears throat> to, to justify myself or to justify myself, uh, the, the decisions uh, to which I have. Uh, which I have uh, lived with, to watch over, to experience closely the decision-making process in international relations, accompanying these uh, two leaders and all their counterparts. They are living in a constant uh, movement of exchanges of ideas, and, and emotions. Uh, please excuse me, somebody's at the door. I'll be back in, in just one second. Well. Sorry, I'm back with you. This is life, this is real life. Yes, indeed. Um, the process of decision-making is a cons constant exchange of emotions, ideas, concepts, and interests. It's already a level not known to the public, not even to the journalist, but which takes in the emotional perception of concepts, ideas, wishes, interests. Let me repeat, it's a, it's a purely emotional perception. And leaders take it in and put it into certain uh, uh, um, positions, into certain uh, drawers of good, bad, uh, um, profitable, not profitable, and so on. Then it goes into the process of well, how can I deal, I, the, the uh, decision maker, deal with this idea, with this concept, with this demand? To searching for an answer. The, uh, the, the process of searching for an answer, I'm not talking about solutions yet, answer, possible answer, options, goes again through the emotional perception process. And it comes up with options. Let's say several options. These options are tested internally, externally, and then a decision is made. The way the decision is exposed to the public looks like an extremely rational process. They must have thought about it in interest. They know all the background. They have the figures. And they are selling, they, decision makers, are selling solutions on a rational level, using rational terms, sometimes emotional ones as well, according to the uh, subject, migration, COVID, certainly a little bit of emotion, empathy is uh, requested for public salesmanship. The, the, uh, the uh, uh, sphere of rationality is only at the end of the salesmanship. Contrary to public belief, and according to my, my experience, it never touches the process of perception and analysis and optional decision-making. 
It only comes in at the end. Now, public wisdom teaches you that everything is rational. Well, I can only vouch for the fact that in the, in the process, in the decision-making process, as I have lived it through, nothing was rational in the process, but everything was super rational in the promotion, in the publication, in the salesmanship. So don't underestimate the emotional process of decision-making. How can diplomats help? Well, if I may say so, the best is alter to, to, to experience alterity diplomacy. In other words, first of all, put yourself in the shoes of the other. Not as usual in, 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 in the economic world, defend my interest, my figures, my salesmanship. Why don't we start looking at requests, problems, crisis? First of all, what others are doing about it? What others are thinking about it? What is their interest? Now, that's a, it seems to be uh, contradictory. I am defending, uh, I'm, I'm paid to defend the state interest, my state interest, any state interest. But the wisest thing to start is, now what do the others think about it? And then approach from their perspective into my own perspective, again, emotional intelligence, and come up with options, discuss them, and so on. This is the real world of decision making. Quite different from the academic uh, descriptions. Thank you. So we have here uh, uh, another uh, question from Anka, uh, our colleague from the University of Bucharest. Anka, mm -hmm. please. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Susanna. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Boleski. It was actually very interesting to, to actually see this connection between uh, between business and uh, and society and social responsibilities, which, mm -hmm. well, in theory, it is present, but in, in practice, you don't see it as much as maybe it should be uh, present. Um, it has been increasingly present, but uh, but I think we still have a long uh, a long way to, to go. But uh, this actually leads me to, to a discussion that we've uh, been having for the last few years in, in the MARPI uh, project regarding the use of diplomacy in connection to different types of organizations. And you've been talking at a certain point about um, the, the use of the term corporate diplomacy and the fact that, okay, we have business diplomacy and corporate diplomacy but the general use is towards uh, corporate diplomacy. And uh, I just want to, to ask something that is, is relevant, uh, increasingly relevant for our project. So for example, in within the, the MARPI Diplo team, we had, we had long discussions. I, I am reading the, the question that I posted in, uh, in the chat. So within the MARPI Diplo team, uh, we had long discussions regarding the political connotations of the word corporate and its historic affiliation to corporation and corporatism. So basically to business along a lot of the times, uh, but we also um, um, would include the let's say diplomacy dimension when we are talking about foundations and non-for-profit associations a lot of, of the times. So um, we would rather be inclined to adopt the expression organizational diplomacy and we've been exploring this uh, maybe under the influence of our uh, let's say communication background uh, so uh, I think it would be of interest to, to us to, to know your thoughts on, uh, on this, on this issue. Thank you very much for this opportunity. First of all, you, the, uh, the uh, uh, sad uh, or the sadness about the fact that uh, um, uh, the uh, business um, activities in the uh, social uh, responsibility area are not sufficient and uh, need uh, uh, a boost, uh, a continuous boost. Let me say that actually it is driven, it was driven in the beginning and it will be driven uh, throughout uh, our uh, times by public expectations. Yeah. It's the public that moves companies. It is their trust, their trust in the company. It is the social credit of these companies which makes them move in the direction of, among other things, but basically social responsibility. Mm -hmm. Number two, 
not very strong on terminology, which is uh, the field of academics. Now I'm too new in the, in the academics field to, to come up with uh, striking terminology. But I would offer to think of the human nature of the behavioral activity that we are promoting through diplomacy. And this human nature of behavioral diplomacy could be put into the term of societal diplomacy. All parts of society, NGOs, association, uh, cities, uh, regions, uh, and so on, could be part of it. In other words, for me, it's a matter of mindset, people's mindset, less than in organizational uh, setting. Beware. Any organizational setting is man made. And what is behind the organizational setting? Man's mind. Organizations, national, international, have been created by mindset, the need for solving certain problems. The organization then takes uh, on uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, its own um, uh, life. Um, dysfunctional international organizations is the uh, end mark uh, of today of international organizations after the Second World War. So I am rather critical and having lived in and worked for organizations, international organizations, that, the, that, that it is much of an organizational um, theme than a human-based mindset and societal theme that we're defending in our diplomacy. What I say is certainly that I'm not sticking to corporate diplomacy. This is just an example. It's one example. Association diplomacy, uh, smart city diplomacy, anything goes. But behind it, and the, the common denominator of it is, in my mind, societal diplomacy. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Then I would have a follow up question uh, regarding this. Um, where would you draw the line at using diplomacy? What line? Well, the, the line regarding the use of the word diplomacy, because at some point, if you add diplomacy to, to everything, then you don't, you, you have an empty word. So, so my question is, uh, to, to what extent can we, can we use diplomacy as, let's say, freely, uh, as, as we are maybe doing it, uh, doing it now, uh, where we, we add diplomacy to, to a lot of, of things, from instruments to, I don't know, mindsets and things like, uh, like that. So we, we have, uh, let's say, uh, public diplomacy, but we also have panda diplomacy. Is, is it okay to add diplomacy to everything? Or is there a line that we should draw at some point in order to, let's say, maintain or keep uh, the integrity of the mm -hmm. practice of the, the, the area of the field? When you talk about integrity, I would substitute it with practicability. It should use a purpose, purpose of harmonizing interests, of avoiding conflicts. That's the practicability. So it's not an art in itself to keep the integrity, the integrity of sovereignty, the integrity of religion or whatever. I would say rather the, the functionality, in my view, it is the functionality that counts. And I, I'm taking you back to a uh, sort of definition that I have suggested in my uh, presentation, which said about the practice of diplomacy as managing situational and contextual ambivalence and harmonizing divergent interests and expectations with a holistic approach of emotional, social, and intercultural intelligence. To fill this gap, I will give you five elements of diplomacy. They are not the ones in Article 3 of the uh, Convention of, of uh, International Relations. They are the real ones. The first one is multi-log, person-to-person contact, face-to-face -face conversation, networking, proactive engagement. 
Number two, emotional cognition. I've gave, given you the example of uh, how the real world of uh, decision making. Emotional cognition and dynamics, the perception management, perception management, not the manager of figures of interest. Perception management, empathy, sensitivity for the other, discretion and humility. Right, it seems very strange for a hardened businessman to talk about discretion and humility. He sees figures. Well, that's not the way to go. In a way of sustainability, societal inclusive action and diplomacy. Number three, dealing with uncertainties through ethically principled pragmatism, the culture and logic of compromise and consensus. This ethically principled pragmatism seems to be a contradiction in itself. Now, what do I mean? Is it either ethical or is it pragmatism? It is both. It is ethically. Companies should be responsible for their ethics and public opinion takes them into ethical principles, into ethical actions. Principled, meaning rule-based, and pragmatism. The last point of pragmatism cannot be denied because pragmatism is the, the feeling of the necessity of the moment, of contextual um, uh, needs uh, uh, of those concerned for a solution. And number four is mutual restraint for the sake of harmonization and sustainability is ideal modes of governance and source of legitimacy. And fifth and last, last Last, awareness of the context of global issues with their contrasting economic, ecological, uh, so, uh, cultural, and uh, social dimensions. In other words, not only power politics play into international relations nowadays, but these factors as well. Um, excuse me, there, there's some. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much for the, for, for the answer. Think, think, of, think of other questions. I'll be back again. Sorry. Yeah. Family life in one minute. Well, uh, we have another question uh, from uh, Haluka. Uh, I, I hope saying your name correctly. <laughs> uh, from the University of Arts of London. Um, just uh, a minute, I hope. No worries. I'll wait. It's okay. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm with you with your next question. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, yes, can you hear me? Not only can I hear you, I can even see you. Oh, <laughs> okay. Hi. Hello, Professor. Hi. So thank you very much for the uh, very energizing um, conference and lecture and very uh, inspiring as well. So I would like you to, I would like to ask you, starting from the, uh, the lecture and um, the perspective that you actually drew about negotiation, collaboration between different uh, actors. Um, and I'd like to draw from a very specific case, which I think that happened during COVID-19. Uh, such cruise, uh, cruise lines, corporations such as Carnival, who actually um, continued operations. And as you said before, business as usual, even though uh, on their ships, there were a lot of people infected by COVID-19. This led, of course, to investigations coming from US government because they didn't respect the measures uh, which were implemented. However, a lot of people were uh, pretty much in a limbo area there because they didn't necessarily, they were stranded for a lot of days and weeks and they were also left behind, uh, let's say in this situation by their embassies as well and their countries. And they felt pretty much, they felt um, left aside and they felt abandoned. And yeah. now my question is, uh, drawing, drawing from your perspective, because I'm very interested in how you said about the role of human agency in, uh, in this way that the multiple actors can actually collaborate and negotiate at the same time. 
And I was very interested in how you actually connect your perspective with these kind of situations when uh, pretty much all the actors that should have acted in the benefit of those people uh, have actually let them down. And you, we continuously heard this kind of messaging and even strategic ignorance coming from these corporations, which kind of, you know, just ignore the, the elephant in the room situation. So I'm very interested in how you can see exactly um, these, these kind of situations in your own um, theoretical framework. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this is a typical example of an early failure in a situation which was unforeseeable, unmanageable, unthinkable. And since the openness of mind and also the responsibility was not there by experience, by former experience of the, far, of the past, we saw a catastrophic failure of all those we thought were responsible. Mm. That's, it, 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 this is a warning, one of the many warnings that this pandemic, for example, has brought about. To be, as I said in the very beginning, in our knowledge management, much more open-minded for the impossible, the unthinkable, the uh, uh, unpredictable, uh, and uh, be more uh, emotional, uh, to, to approach uh, things of this nature in a more emotional, intelligent, and empathetic way. You, are you totally right? We failed. In other words, international society, roughly mm -hmm. speaking, failed. But that should serve, serve as a lesson mm. to be Thank you very much. more better prepared. And the preparation starts in your mindset. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So, anyone? I don't have here uh, as far as I'm able. Susanna, if I can, please. Yes, of course. I, I didn't have the time okay. to write it down. Uh, thank you very much for, for, your, uh, for uh, your, all your insights. They were really uh, uh, food for thought. Um, can you please just elaborate a little bit more in one sentence that you presented that uh, corporate diplomacy provides soft power for non-state authors? I, I, I don't, I, I think I, I missed the idea. Uh, because usually money, it's an asset from art power and not from soft power. Right, what I had in mind is um, the example of smart cities. Smart cities have, uh, uh, cities in itself, uh, cities of a certain size, have uh, social problems uh, that they share, migration, uh, transport, uh, uh, security, uh, uh, cyber attacks, and so on and so forth. There is a certain part of it to be dealt with financial means, resources. But there's also another part of the how-to, the knowledge to. That's what I call, I call the soft power of diplomacy. And it starts with the, the five elements of diplomacy that I've given you, multi-log. In other words, networking on this problem, which falls upon a community or it falls upon a city. Networking with other uh, groups concerned by the same problem networking and that's where uh, diplomacy comes in, into play because the, the basics of networking is first of all knowing the other knowing the problem of the other and sharing the search for solutions this is why i consider that corporate diplomacy has the potential of soft power it shows you certain ways of how to Think and act through the middle of conflictual situation towards compromise and consensus building. And that is not a matter of money. That's not a matter of resources. That's a way of how to think and how to go about 
and how to eventually use your resources, obviously. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I... If I may also, Susanna? Yes, please, please my guest. <laughs> well, thank you, Ambassador and Professor Golevsky, for also very inspiring and, and really, indeed, challenging um, uh, presentation. And, uh, well, first of all, uh, let me also uh, thank you for the good news that you brought uh, all of us who are still active in uh, international relations and diplomacy, that we are not out of job for the foreseeable future, since uh, there's still some um, soft skills not just soft power, but also soft skills, still um, not uh, at the reach of algorithms and technologies. So I guess that people will still matter in uh, future diplomacy, at least in the near future. And that's already good news. Um, well, seriously enough, or more seriously enough, um, I was also very uh, um, interested in uh, your triple solidarity approach um, the solidarity between government, business, and, and science. And it also reminded me of, um, of the, uh, the triple helix uh, approach that some authors also have on the, on the public, private, and the third sector uh, approach. And mm -hmm. I, was just, I was just wondering, um, it's true that probably many of, um, of the issues that we are now confronted with require first and foremost a change of attitude, a change of hearts. Um, and that uh, probably that's, uh, that should be at the start, at the outset of any uh, operational um, approach. But still, I was just wondering, um, in order to operationalize this approach, how concrete can we go or should we go, if at all, in terms of understanding the framework of how this, this set of actions are then to be um, implemented. <clears throat> Two uh, specific questions. Well, the diplomacy is still, I mean, uh, all, despite all the, um, all the objectives that we may um, attach to it, it's still something that has to be uh, somehow related to, to the government. I mean, obviously there's, there's uh, the brand ambassadors and and so on. But still, I mean, diplomacy as we know it has to, to have a link. And in order to, to uh, legitimize uh, diplomacy, governments have also a certain degree of accountability to, um, to endure before parliaments, for instance. So how in this mix of different state and non-state actors, how can one government then justify and legitimize some of these actions, uh, which it implements together with other businesses. Why this business and not the other one? Why this organization and not the other one? And a second, also specific question related to this one, with a view to trying to operationalize your concepts. How, I mean, you mentioned that maybe uh, money is not so much of the matter, but still, how can we finance uh, things that we still have to finance? And even how can we finance the efforts of a corporate Diplomat, uh, will it still be on the on the charge of the sending uh, state uh, on the government, or do you even foresee the possibility of uh, some tasks being so privatized that even uh, non-state actors can pay the um, the allowance or the um, salary of such a corporate diplomat? Thank you. Let me, thank you very much. Let me start with the second one immediately. Well, I think it, it would be wise policy, wise resource policy, and wise economic policy to engage these corporate diplomats wherever they come from. Actually, they can be trained. They can be uh, former diplomats, or they can be trained. Uh, this is an, 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 an art which one can learn and practice. And it should, but it shouldn't be on the payroll, if you wish, of those that use them, the associations, the smart cities, the corporations and others, and nobody else. I don't, I don't see the government sending around its people, for example, 
as corporate diplomats. Nevertheless, I have thought about smart cities. It would be wise if the central government um, keeps a diplomatic contact, even a personal contact, with its regions, with its smart cities, in exchange of those functionaries working at the, at the ministry for a limited time. In other words, there could very well be an exchange of personnel, but the finance would be the one who's profiting from it uh, in, in the first place. The first question, I am not sure if I really got the gist of it. How does government legitimize its decisions with and including non-state actors? Have I understood this correctly? Well, when I was in the ministry, we started to see the need around ecological problems to include uh, associations and uh, uh, interest groups uh, in, be before making up um, um, a for working up out a, a position for international conferences. And we thought it would be better to have them in our ministry or in our uh, groupings, even physically in, than having them protesting outside. Now that's a very um, a bureaucratic uh, attitude, but I think it holds uh, itself as, as, as um, a convincing uh, argument. That was, to me, my, uh, in my mind, the beginning of legitimizing, legitimizing by including. We could say in the ministry, yes, we have taken in uh, the, the opinions of these organizations and different, with different interests, and therefore our position is cohesive with their interest. So that's the inclusion, I think, would be one best term of legitimizing government action. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, another question. And Marie, uh, can you please? Of course. Um, uh, it, it was it was around um, a well, um, a subject which is which is very important for us within uh, public relations, and it's it's a dimension of license to operate. So um, you refer to the wider common good of societies and the bottom line of long term shareholder values at a certain moment. And I, I wanted to see how how you would uh, define uh, the concept of license to operate from the perspective of a corporate diplomat. Um, and I, I was wondering if there wasn't a complementary uh, communication perspective that could be added to manage to the managerial one, uh, reinforcing the role of the corporate diplomat when they strategically advise decision makers how to think and to act responsibly, not only uh, through the middle of conflictual situations towards compromise, but also before and after these uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Very wide-ranging uh, question. I would say the corporate diplomat <clears throat> should be working in the context of a social license and societal license of to, 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 to operate and not only a government license to operate. And uh, that is their, their, their extensive range for the wider common good. It's, it's a matter of being positioned in the, in the uh, uh, cooperative structure as well. It should be close to the top, but have good uh, feelings for uh, general uh, impact. And it should have follow-up contact. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say, uh, well, we have uh, just a few minutes for the last question, Anka. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. My my question is is rather short. I'm still in the terminology part, <laughs> so I, I'm sticking to that. Um, so basically, uh, you are talking about uh, the mass donation, uh, you know, from Alibaba and from Zara. And yeah. do you, in that uh, in that context, are we 
are we in a corporate diplomacy logic, in an international relations logic, or in a public, uh, public affairs logic? How do you see it? Let me repeat, public affairs or give me uh, the answer. Corporate diplomacy, international relations or public affairs logic, because we have uh, local actors uh, working locally, but in, you know, in, in connection to an international structure. Uh, so, so that I, I'm actually curious to see, to see your, your uh, opinion on this. Okay. Not to choose any of them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I would still refer to the social credit of these companies. And the social credit is something that even outweighs their resources. A company, I imagine, and I can think of some uh, Indian context, can fail not only within resources or lack of resources, but because of the lack of re reputation and the social acceptance of their activities in human rights terms and others. So the real credit they are aiming at is the social acceptance meaning social credit in society. Apart from that, they must make business uh, and, and, and profit, no doubt about it. But today, the, the value of uh, a company and value of uh, their activities is much more wider than just making profit. That's number one. The rest is to follow. And the rest is determining their reputation and their continuing in um, um, uh, acceptance in society. And it's not only a monetary term, it's a matter of social credit, as I said. So about these public relations, cooperation or international relations, I think I'll, I'll, I'll put it all into one other basket, a third, a fourth basket, basket of social credit. All right, okay, thank you very much. Well, um, I, I, I think now we have more questions. Uh, uh, it, it is like this. I say, let's, it's the last one. Indeed. And now, uh, 10 others are coming. Purpose, purpose, uh, uh, before beginning the questions, I, I can begin saying, this is the last question. And then <laughs> we would have a lot of them. Uh, um, well, uh, uh, I promise. Uh, Professor Bolensky to, to close in time mm -hmm. and to, to, to do it. Uh, uh, so, yes, it's, uh, as I told you, a never ended story. Uh, uh, it was a very rich debate. I, I, I thank you, all of you, to participate, to be here with us uh, all this time. Uh, and um, but I need to uh, uh, end. So uh, uh, to close this uh, mark, Dipo uh, talk Lisbon. I, I lost your sound. I think we all did. Yeah, I think I think it was really too close. So she she becomes silent, but I think she was going to tell me to take the floor and uh, give some final <laughs> words on this. Well, thank you very much, Professor uh, uh, Bolevsky. Well, uh, you told us, please uh, call me Will, and I will <laughs> call you Will. So okay. thank you very much for uh, all your insights. It was a, a very interesting approach. I must say that uh, uh, some of the questions that uh, remain for answering uh, were uh, somehow related uh, to some of uh, uh, some highlights I have here. Um, and to, to close this session, uh, I will uh, just uh, remind or just leave uh, on the, the, the spectrum some of your uh, thoughts, mainly the, your definition of diplomacy, that it's a, a really uh, fresh, um, a fresh look at it, uh, has the managing situational and contextual ambivalence and harmonizing the, uh, divergent interests and expectations 
within mm -hmm. an holistic approach of emotional, social and intercultural intelligence. And uh, I think uh, um, Sandra, one of our colleagues were, uh, was here highlighting one of the topics that is really hot in this uh, scenario is the environmental question. It's the climate crisis. And uh, um, I think your approach, your holistic approach and the need to sensitize all the powers and uh, and when I say powers, I'm not only talking about the soft powers, I'm uh, talking about uh, every players uh, in, in the world, uh, the most powerful in one uh, area and the least powerful uh, on another. Um, it's also uh, very um, insightful to see the, the, the need for most, more whistleblowers and uh, leaders prepare to set the path uh, towards a better world where it is possible to distinguish purposes, uh, purposes for life instead of uh, interest-driven objectives uh, that it's most of what we are, have nowadays. And you come here and you make a presentation uh, calling our brain and uh, um, seeding some uh, different approaches. Well, not totally new because uh, in the field of public relations, public expectations are something that uh, are, we share a lot and we study a lot. So it's a, a topic that uh, is very shared in our field. So uh, maybe we can uh, do some more uh, symposiums and uh, exchanges uh, of ideas and merging our, uh, our fields uh, because um, if we consider these public expectations, we need to, to understand uh, very well what are publics and what kind of publics there are and uh, all their expectations, but also their behavior. And I will finish with uh, your proposal for uh, a human nature behavior approach to uh, diplomacy, calling it societal diplomacy. And this societal diplomacy uh, goes uh, behind an organizational centric uh, mindset and displays the focus for a uh, human based mindset. I would dare to say a societal uh, centric diplomacy. Uh, I don't know if you agree, it's a lot of big words, but it's really, uh, it really um, opens somehow the door uh, for another concept in our project that is civic diplomacy. Uh, and maybe it can fit in, on these ideas. So we'll, we really hope to have you uh, in a future session. Uh, maybe uh, in presence, uh, it will be much nice. Still, this online session was really, really uh, enlightful and rich. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. <laughs>